Today's forum is sponsored by Deloitte, represented by Ken Wexel and his colleagues, the, uh, and then uh, also the Robert Weiler Company, Bob, again, and his colleagues. Uh, also like to thank our partner, uh, Patrick Tiernan and his associates from Colum the Columbus Council on World Affairs, who are here today. Uh, please thank all of them for their support. And now I'd like to welcome Ken to the stage to introduce today's speaker. If, if I didn't do that, you would realize that my cell phone does not have a um, ringtone of the Ohio State fight song, but rather the theme song from the good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> and that would probably not be good. Uh, good afternoon. Like Bob Weiler and the company he leads, Deloitte is proud to be a sponsor of the Columbus Metropolitan Club. The CMC provides the citizens of Columbus with an important platform for discussing social, political, economic, and cultural issues of concern to the community. At Deloitte, we share that commitment, and we believe we too have a powerful role to play in strengthening our communities. Our strong culture of service and our desire to make meaningful social impact that also delivers significant business value is at the heart of our community involvement initiative. So on behalf of my partners, directors, and colleagues at Deloitte, we're honored and proud to be a sponsor of today's luncheon. A biography for our speaker is in your forum flyer, so I'll provide a brief introduction. As president of the Ohio State University, the Ohio State University, Today's speaker oversees six campuses, 65,000 students, and nearly 48,000 faculty and staff. In 2009, Time Magazine named him as one of the top 10 university presidents in the country. He has also served as the president of Vanderbilt University, Brown University, the University of Colorado, and West Virginia University, as well as his previous presidential role at The Ohio State University from 1990 to 1997. In fact, that is the period when I first met Dr. Gee. I'm sure those of you in the audience today who have been fortunate enough to meet Gordon each have a great story to tell about that encounter. Well, mine goes something like this. I was a rather junior member of a small Deloitte team attending a meeting with Dr. Gee in his conference room. At precisely the top of the hour, in comes this ball of energy who sits down at the head of the table, right next to me, tucks his one leg under himself, leans forward with his elbows at the head of the table, looks me directly in the eye and chirps, what are we here to talk about today? <laughs> Have any of you had that kind of experience with Gordon? <laughs> well, I thought about a way to properly introduce our speaker and make it personal. So I reached out in the last few days to a dozen people who I know each enjoy a close relationship with you, Dr. Gee. I asked them to give me one word that best describes you, and I was pleasantly surprised that every one of them responded to my request. I think that's saying something in these days. And here is what they said. Ambassador, engaged, all in, endearing, tireless, enthusiastic, committed, unflappable, colorful, dynamic, infatigable, supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, <laughs> and underpaid. <laughs> I, I thought you'd like that one. And, and Bob, that was not from an OSU board member, just so you know. <laughs> so, on behalf of the CMC, the Robert Weiler Company, and our partner at the Columbus Council on World, of World Affairs, please welcome our speaker, Dr. E. Gordon Gee. Well, thank you. Um, thank you, Ken, very much. I, uh, yeah, uh, Ken did uh, ask me for my opinion of myself. You can guess which one that uh, I indicated. <laughs> Anyway, I'm, I'm grateful to be here. I truly am grateful to be here today. And uh, I just want to say something about the Metropolitan Club. It's always been a place that uh, has been open to ideas. 
It's been a place that has been very welcoming. It's been a place that has been very welcoming to me. So, Rich, thank you for letting me come and uh, speak with you today, and more importantly, um, to be part of a place in which uh, we can actually have a common discussion about common issues at a time in which uh, we find uncommon challenges. And so, I really do appreciate that. And uh, and I want to I want to thank our board uh, members for being here. I want to thank my colleagues from the university. I want to thank all of those who have uh, come here today. It's a wonderful setting, wonderful time. So. Um, I'm going to get started uh, uh, immediately because I want to do. Ha I want to have an opportunity to take questions. I think that's always important. Uh, Emerson uh, once said, and, and Emerson is one of my favorites. Uh, I, this this thing follows off. You won't miss much here. But uh, Emerson once says, "Spartans, Stoics, heroes, saints, and gods uh, use a short and positive speech." Um, now I offer that quotation by way of saying two things. First. Uh, Spartan Stoics, heroes, and uh, so on, I am none of the above. I think you all know that. And second, while I intend to be wholly positive, I may not necessarily be brief. Um, today, I want to synthesize several thoughts that have been swirling around with me for some time, um, several themes, and to do so through a narrative that is in part personal. A combination of recent milestones, my five-year mark at, uh, at uh, Ohio State leading the university the second time, the birth of my identical twin granddaughters, uh, the new year, of course, my 69th birthday, I finally will admit how old I am, uh, has made me reflect during the past few months on this unique moment in, uh, in time. It, it has caused me to consider my personal journey and the nexus among my own life story, the essential role of public higher education and the larger progress toward truly inclusive equality. At that in intersection, I found an urgency, a calling to build upon Ohio State's proud legacy and accelerate progress toward the ideals of global engagement and human equality. Doing so requires individual change in head and heart and a willingness to hold ourselves and one another to strict account. This weekend, I returned from Brazil where I was on a fact-finding and friend-raising trip. I'm still, by the way, catching my breath. If you can't tell, I'm, I'm not going to uh, scatter any Portuguese. I only learned one word, and that was uh, thank you. And to be sure, Brazil can take one's breath away. Our home base was in Sao Paulo, a city of 22 million people, the largest city in South America. The architecture, by the way, is bold. The traffic, abysmal. I will just have to say that. The purpose of our trip is part of a larger global strategy to build partnerships, discover new opportunities for both Ohio State and the state of Ohio, and explore the possibility of opening our third global gateway office. In 2010, we opened a gateway in Shanghai, China, and just last spring, we opened one in Mumbai, India. These offices are small in stature, but very large in purpose. They serve as home bases for the university's expanding teaching and research collaborations around the world, as well as connecting points for thousands of students and alumni living and working abroad. Our interest in Brazil is not new, by the way. Ohio State has sustained academic and research partnerships in Brazil, particularly in agriculture, for 49 years. The country is a major emerging economy with excellent universities, first-rate researchers, and a new government program that aims to send 45,000 Brazilian students to U.S. STEM programs within the next three years. Now, let me put that last bit into perspective. We currently have 14 Brazilian students at our university. 14, let me just underscore that. So we have room for more, I can assure you. <laughs> I was joined on the trip by Carol Whitaker, our wonderful Vice President for Research, David Williams, who is uh, here today, our Dean of uh, College of Engineering, and William Brewstein, also with us, our Vice Provost for Global Strategies. Uh, together, we visited universities, high schools, alumni, uh, government officials, and business leaders, and on this past Friday, we visited the Sao Paulo Research Foundation where we signed a $1.4 million research partnership. The university already has existing partnerships between researchers there and here, such as in translational plant science, and we now are extending collaborations in other areas. That trip to Brazil underscored to me the need, the real imperative to move from global engagement to global embodiment. I'll explain more about what I mean by that, but the headline is this. As the world shrinks, opportunity grows, and we must change ourselves and our institutions in order to seize those opportunities. Doing so is both the smart thing, the smart thing, and the right thing. 
Since my return to Ohio State in 2007, I have written and spoken on several occasions about the themes of the modern land-grant university's global mission. In this turbulent economy, I also often talk about higher education's role in preparing students to find jobs. We know the statistics about the remarkable monetary value of a college degree. That is important and true and proper, but let us think for a moment, and this is really the point, let us think for a moment about the notion of value in a larger context. After 33 years and much thinking, I've come to believe that the most basic value of public higher education is its role in advancing our understanding of who we are as humans and expanding human liberty and human potential and broadening how we define ourselves and view the world and in deepening our compassion and self-expression. Public higher education is the fuel and fire that moves us forward individually and collectively toward the long horizon of achieving the nation's founding promise, that promise that was embodied in that great statement, we the people. So ladies and gentlemen, our duty, yours and mine, uh, certainly all of us in this room together, is to assume assertive leadership in defining, the no, uh, defining that particular notion for the 21st century. So what does we the people mean in the year 2013? The answer's path. Uh, our route on the march toward that noble horizon can be traced from our university's founding. By the force of the Morrell Act th that he signed into law, Ohio State is Mr. Lincoln's university. I want everyone to think about that. We are Mr. Lincoln's university, and that living legacy requires much of us. It is a moral birthright which demands that we strive to be as bold and daring and valiant in our time as he was in his. The great emancipator understood the leaps of human progress made possible by these incredible new land-grant universities. It is incumbent upon us to take the pen from Lincoln's hand and to move the line ever forward, to draw a new path where none exists today. Drawing a fresh map in this honorary era demands an invigorated standard of civility, a wholly new way of thinking about such issues as race, nationality, religion, and gender. We must move from tolerating differences in backgrounds and perspectives to embracing them. That, if I say nothing else, is a keystone for success in the 21st century. And because of our breadth and scale, because the world is on our campus and we are equally immersed throughout the world, Ohio State is distinctively positioned to lead, uh, to lead us to this new model for the future. From my second floor office, and some of you have visited my office uh, on campus, I have a unique vantage point to see across the oval that great, that great piece of green space, the physical heart of the university. Through the trees and the grass, sidewalks zig and zag, intersect and diverge. Each day, tens of thousands of people, all shapes, sizes, ages from across the state, and more than 100 countries around the world make their way to class, to studios, to laboratories, and to the library. It is an inspiring view, a beautiful mosaic of people and cultures framed by promise and possibility. At ground level, the oval, that same small spot on the face of this earth, might seem like chaos. It could seem discordant and jarring, a dissonant blur of unlike people moving erratically, cutting through and around at dizzying speeds, uh, speaking incomprehensible languages. In all, in all, the oval is a Surratt painting at close range, just dots and colors. But step back and the perspective changes. My office on the second floor offers a perch with just enough distance to enable the viewer to perceive the patterns, the purpose of design, and the incomparable beauty of people and potential. Just before I left for Brazil a couple of weeks ago, this metaphor really struck me. I was just looking out and it really did strike me. Ohio State's Oval is not merely the physical heart of the university. It is also a place from which hope and light radiate without ceasing. It is the crucible from which a better and more just global future will emerge. I began a moment ago with three elements. My life's journey, the role of public higher education, and progress toward human equality. They are all intertwined, as I looked at it, on that great historic oval. By way of reckoning the sum of these parts, allow me first to tease them out, starting with public higher education in its central role in the Republic's founding. Conceived 
and created in the age of enlightenment this new nation had the advantage of a starting point rooted in optimism religious freedom science art and what were at the time radical notions of human progress here in this brave new world the son of masons might not necessarily apprentice to his father perhaps studying and becoming a lawyer instead the daughters of not only nobility but also of shopkeepers might now be taught to read in this new world the shackles of historical habit and inertia were being cast off and education was the unlocking key education was the foundation of optimism for the future and belief in the ability of free people to think to reason to debate and to act in noblest pursuit of the common good the authority of this new nation would rest in its people and the general dispersion of knowledge was requisite in the people's hand would rest what thomas jefferson in that beautiful phrase called the sacred fire of liberty and only an educated citizenry could be capable of governing themselves education freedom and human progress were then and are today fully intertwined and yet as brightly as those ideals shown 250 years ago we all know the rest of the story it is an imperfect one to be sure we must acknowledge that it is impossible to square the high-minded notion of this new human liberty with the horrors of slavery the shameful treatment of women and Native Americans and immigrants and all of those regarded as quote others unquote even today this country's founding ideals are yet to be fully realized we can however and this is what is important we can however trace the line through history a strong route of progress and expanded opportunity and moving that line ever forward is the central purpose of public higher education and what I've come to see as the sacred responsibility the sacred responsibility of Ohio State. It is embedded in our founding mission in the enduring principles of the Morrell Act, which extended the promise of education beyond the sole province of the wealthy, the white, and those living in cities. It is important to recall the times in which President Lincoln had the vision and wisdom to sign that act. 1862 was the year of the Battle of Shiloh, the Second Bull Run, and Antietam. The losses were nearly incomprehensible at a time when uncertainty was high and hope was scarce Lincoln understood that extending the line of human progress through educational opportunities was both the smart thing and the right thing it was both the practical means to remake the nation as well as the next step in making we the people real to so many who had been excluded from its promise Lincoln the son of illiterate parents from the country's vast frontier recognized that the story of human progress is inextricably bound to education further he understood the pragmatic necessity of a bold new system of public higher education in reuniting and remaking the nation once the cannons and the rifles were silent I am personally mindful of that vision and purpose each and every day a copy of Lincoln's second inaugural uh, speech is framed above my desk and I looked at it early this morning at home reminding me of the duty carried by that proud heritage 148 years ago this month a month before he was assassinated Lincoln delivered that address as he said with high hope for the future so after so many years of war and turmoil and uncertainty Lincoln somehow had hope for the future that is Ohio State's inheritance and acting as mere caretaker, caretakers is simply not enough the university's land-grant mission defines the institution's commitment to improving individual lives and enriching communities our imperative is to understand that today's calling is for us to reinterpret our founding principles for the contemporary context and not just for today but aiming for the ever-expanding horizon of the global development of human potential and equality Ohio State does so by building upon a tremendous legacy and momentum that same oval I see each and every day has always radiated light and hope every person who comes to us in search of a better understanding of the world and a better grasp of his or her own potential leaves campus carrying this Ohio State experience into their communities those graduates many in this room are Ohio State's story they are the stories of a university that has helped move the state and nation forward they are the stories that bear repeating nearly a century ago for example Ohio State played a crucial role in educating African Americans in an era when the doors to many colleges and universities were closed by 1938 the university led the nation among 
all non historically black institutions in bachelor's master's and doctoral degrees earned by african americans of the nine doctors granted to african americans in the u s that year three were from the ohio state university one of those dissertations by reed jackson considered how best to educate african americans to thrive as teachers in the american south the power the power of dr jackson's light radiates today through countless teachers and students through their children's children and through central state university which he helped to found and yet and yet here again we must acknowledge the full story the university's shortcomings as well as its great contributions toward equality the painful truth is that at the same time ohio state was leading the nation in providing educational opportunities to African Americans, our campus allowed racist practices to persist on what should have been the freest and fairest soil in this state. Remember, this was the day of the great Jesse Owens, who put to lie Hitler's horrendous assumptions about human ability and equality in the 1936 Berlin Olympics. We all know about Owens' incredible determination and ability and drive. What we do not talk about, but what amplifies his astonishing accomplishments to me even more is his daily experience. Jesse Owens was a student unwelcome to live on his own campus as the dormitories excluded African Americans. He was breaking world records without winning a track scholarship. This son of sharecroppers and grandson of slaves worked nights as an elevator operator to pay his tuition. The power and grace and determination of Jesse Owens radiated out from this campus to the world and back again. His example moved all of us forward, well past the indignities he endured. And as the world was Jesse Owens' big stage, so too now is the world Ohio State stage. Our global engagement began some 60 years ago with the partnership with Punjab Agricultural University in India. What started there with student exchanges and basic agricultural assistance has flourished into a collaboration that includes the public and private sectors and is helping that great nation feed itself. Today, the university's engagements around the world are flourishing. Some American universities have developed educational outposts in other countries, essentially recreating the American model of higher education in the middle of other cultural, uh, uh, in the middle of other cultures and customs. But as the provost and I were considering the right approach, we decided to create global gateways portals that are fully reciprocal in nature. They are, and I call them this precisely because they are exactly like that, they are embassies of a kind. The idea is to position ourselves to partner with others, not to impose our own solutions. By the numbers, Ohio State is already a massive global institution. Our faculty held from nearly 100 nations, and our alumni live in more than 150. Think about that. We have more than 6,000 international students putting us in the nation's top 10 for international student enrollment. And each year we send off one of the largest contingents of study abroad students for which we rank in the top 15 nationally and will move up quickly with our new semester. As we continue to reinvent and renew ourselves, we find additional ways to give students international experiences. This is the first year of our new semester system and as part of that transformation we have developed a global May program offering more than 30 different study abroad sessions aimed particularly at first and second year students. Those experiences empower our students in myriad ways. Skills that last a lifetime are learned by figuring out how to operate a self-service laundromat in Guatemala City or to order a vegetarian meal in the mountains of Portugal. All of these things are, to my mind, global engagement. But global embodiment is much more than that. It is about actively and aggressively seeking out others' perspectives. It is about breaking free of our own personal and historical expectations and boundaries by developing new ways of thinking, talking, and interacting with one another. Doing so requires we check our thinking at every turn and reject assumptions built on parochial conversations. That brings me to my own journey, my own personal journey, and my reflections on what it means to lead the Ohio State University at this moment of great possibility and responsibility. Let me, let me be plain, despite leading universities for nearly half my life, I am a most unlikely university president. I'm an accidental president, actually. <laughs> unlikely by virtue of several factors, uh, academic background, temperament, faith, and family history. As some of you know, I grew up in Vernal, Utah, a tiny town on the Colorado state uh, line. 
It is situated on a two-lane stretch of U.S. Highway 40, a two-lane stretch, the same road that runs outside the Columbus Metropolitan Club's front door. But the view from Route 40 in Vernal bears absolutely no resemblance to the view from <laughs> Broad Street, I can assure you. When I was growing up, Vernal consisted of about 2,000 people. The largest attraction was and is nearby Dinosaur National Monument. The irony of the most popular characters in town being 150 million years old was never lost on me. I want you to know that. <laughs> it was an isolated town with no television and only a 500-watt radio station. Books and the radio were my companions and my teachers, and I became an early fan of Shakespeare and opera. My world was my family, my faith, school, and Boy Scouts. But because my family traveled some, I knew that there was a very different world outside of Vernal. Yet, I was 18 before I had the opportunity to know others unlike myself. Until I graduated high school and moved away, everyone I knew was white, Mormon, and Republican. <laughs> the, the values of our small town were uniform because of our shared starting point, unchallenged by others from varying personal histories and perspectives. Although I did not realize it at the time, this was an odd beginning from which to grow, an odd beginning from which to become a university president. I knew there was more, and I wanted to learn and to experience the world. My Mormon faith includes a mission, as it does with almost all young Mormons. I spent three years in Germany as a young man discussing religion and history and culture with people wholly unlike myself. That experience ignited my curiosity about others and the larger world. Being tossed into such a radically different environment uh, with a clear purpose but little training made me self-sufficient as nothing else could. My own growth from that mission is one of the reasons I am so determined to ensure Ohio State students have the opportunity to, to experience life in another country. During the past 50 post vernal years, I have had the pleasure of living many places and experiencing many parts of the world. One of the greatest joys of my life comes from knowing and appreciating others who think entirely unlike myself. That active intellectual and social engagement is why I chose the work of higher education. The reality of a great public university in America is dynamic, challenging and ever-changing, as you can only imagine. That is the nature of the work itself, the creation and dissemination of new knowledge. Ideas are developed. Boundaries are erased. But the fabulous churning and changing on the campus of a large public university, such as Ohio State, is also the result of bringing together unlike people from unlike backgrounds in search of a common purpose. Although the community that is produced by mixing together all of these people is temporary, and while tensions are necessarily created, it presents an unparalleled environment for social and human progress. Students, faculty, and staff are forced to grapple with and understand different perspectives and different cultures. That unceasing challenge is the very thing that moves us forward toward embracing truly diverse, truly global perspectives. Ohio State, Ohio State has really changed a great deal in the past five years. We have come to a point in our history where we are now a great, thoroughly global institution that is rooted in this wonderful state of Ohio. The university has set a very high standard for itself on the world stage. To live up to that standard of high performance, we must change institutionally and individually. As I travel the world, it is clear to me that in order to succeed, we must actively reach out to others to understand their lives and their worldviews. At the same time, we must embrace differences in culture and race and religion and welcome the totality of the person who exists uniquely as a single human being. For my part, and this is very personal, I must cultivate the change in order to lead effectively, my own personal uh, change. I must constantly reevaluate my assumptions and my thinking. The boy from Vernal, Utah, born 10 years before the flawed notion of separate but equal, uh, and just 24 years after women were granted the right to vote, now leads a $6 billion global enterprise. The dinosaurs of my past must remain there in Utah. In the, in the small, flat, and connected world we now occupy, a university president must always think bigger, and that is my commitment to you and to myself. Even as my worldview has greatly expanded, I have at times misstepped. It is no secret that my attempts at humor to break the tension, to ease uh, myself into a challenging moment, to establish rapport have sometimes had quite the opposite effect. 
Those kinds, but let me just say this. Those kinds of offhand comments do not reflect my own thinking, and certainly they are not the Ohio State ideal. 20th century values have no place in a forward-thinking world, and I take that very much as my own responsibility as a leader. Turning 69 last month caused me to reflect on the arc of my life, my career, the institution I lead, and this remarkable moment in time. We are at the precipice of great human progress. I believe that so clearly. Most visibly, of course, at the macro level, our laws, our collective mores, and yet moving further, striding more assertively toward the ideal of we the people requires personal individual change. What is required now, I believe, is for us to eradicate the vestiges of our own personal histories that limit us and limit our thinking. Doing so is not charity. It is what all of us of good will and good intent in this year 2013 must do for ourselves, our communities, our businesses, our children, and our shared future. So before I close, and I know that's always a wonderful word, uh, <laughs> I want to talk a bit about our students. To my great good fortune, and I say this from the bottom of my heart, to my great good fortune, I am surrounded each day by members of the millennial generation, young people who offer us a behavioral guidepost. And they are arguably the first generation to regard themselves as global citizens. At colleges and universities across the country, we are seeing increases in the number of graduating students applying to public service programs, such as the Peace Corps, Teach for America, and AmeriCorps. Ohio State now ranks among the top 10 nationally in producing B Peace Corps volunteers. Global engagement that bridges divides takes other forms as well. Our engineering students continue to pursue their longstanding work with an orphanage for HIV infected children in Honduras. As students uh, work to improve the water system and the food supply, they are breaking barriers of culture and language and gaining infinitely more than they give. One more example involves our Fisher College of Business. A few years ago, they began what is now one of the nation's largest conferences on social entrepreneurship. They line up sponsors and speakers and host a business plan competition and innovation marketplace, all to improve the lives of people whose experiences are unlike their own. The millennial generation's values are more inclusive, compassionate, caring, and generous than any I have known over the past 30 year, 33 years of leading a university. They choose substance over spin, principle over profit, action over apathy. By questioning received knowledge, they lead us in advancing against the prevailing standard. In many ways, they lead our global, truly multicultural thinking, and our duty is to help refine their direction, educate them for leadership, and enable them to take the wheel. It is they who will take Lincoln's pen, let me say this clearly, it is they who will take Lincoln's pen from our hands and use it to extend the line of human progress in ways we cannot imagine. Indeed, they are already doing so. And so, ladies and gentlemen, as I think about our opportunity at this moment, I want to end with just a very few thoughts. The fundamental role of higher education, particularly public education, is to recast our relationship with one another and with the world around us, to extend the franchise of personal opportunity. It is the vehicle through which we are able to pursue this nation's founding ideals of human liberty and equality. Those are the transcendent truths that we do not talk about. They are not part of our public discourse but they are Ohio State's first principles. They matter, and in order to move forward, we must give them voice. Noble purposes transcend doctrinaire thinking. Conventional thinking will prove insufficient to the task of finding solutions to global challenges. We have a covenant. We have a clear covenant to both our history and those who will follow us. We must thoroughly reevaluate our ideas, revitalize our perspectives, and recommit to the ideals of social progress in a 21st century global society. No more searching, in my view, for a compass. We know what we need to do. We must change our institutions, and we must begin by changing ourselves. So I thank you for letting me be here today. Thank, thank you, sir. It's it. It's terrific to have um, such a wonderful steward for our own
Lincoln legacy. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a strong tradition here at the Metropolitan Club, for those of you who are members who have been guests before, to save time for questions from our audience. Uh, just to remind you that the CMC records our forums for statewide broadcast on the Ohio channel. They, also, they are also available on YouTube through our website. If you have a question for Dr. Gee, please come to the microphone and please introduce yourself, and we thank you in advance for not making long editorial comments or the spread of the game. Uh, <laughs> any, any questions? I'm always there to break the ice. Thank you, Dr. Gee. We really, really genuinely appreciate you being at the Metropolitan Club. It means a great deal to us. My name's Jane Scott. Um, I'm curious, we do have so many international students. Um, are we making any progress at all in your mind, or do we need to make the progress to uh, provide green cards or H-1Bs for those students to be able to remain in the United States? We invest a great deal of money yeah. educating them, and then we don't welcome them back to work. You, you know, the, uh, the interesting thing, Jane, thank you very much for the question. Uh, if you can remember the last time I was here, someone asked me something similar, and I said that my, my, my long-term view, and in fact, my real hope is, first of all, that every student at Ohio State has a, uh, has a, uh, a passport. When, when I came back in 2007, about 35 or 40 percent had, now well over 90 percent had. I wanted to require it, but I was told that something <laughs> called the Eighth Amendment didn't allow that to happen. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so we strongly urge that. But the other part of that is that we, we graduate these fabulous international students, and I would love to staple a green card to their, uh, to their diploma so that they can stay and be here with us. Because, uh, <laughs> and, and, the, and the reason is pretty simple. The world is very small. Education uh, finds itself everywhere, and uh, and the opportunities that we have with these great international students who are a part of our family now, to continue to contribute to their lives here and to our lives, and continue to grow our economy is very important. It's very important for the state of Ohio. But for international students, we would not have Google, we wouldn't have Facebook, we wouldn't have Apple. We can go on and on and on. We can talk about that. Now, obviously, we'd love to have our 530,000 living alumni all the way around the world. We had a wonderful gathering of about 100 in uh, Sao Paulo. Everywhere we go, you find them. But we do uh, want to make certain that there is a reason for comfort and stability for them to stay here and be part of, uh, of this growing opportunity that exists in this country, too. Questions? Uh, thank you so much, uh, President Gee, for such a wonderful uh, insight into going global. As we know, going global has many challenges. What were some of the challenges OSU faced in going to China and India, and how did you overcome those difficult challenges? Well, you know, I have William Brustein here, who's our great global strategist. I think, I think this, uh, uh, and that's a great question. I think, and it comes back to what I said a little bit earlier. Some of my, some of my colleague universities have, uh, have around the country have taken the American system and trying to implant them in in places overseas. We made a determination uh, that that was not in our best interest because we wanted, to be, uh, we wanted to be partners. We did not want to be imperialists. And so from that point of view, what we have done is we have really created these global gateways for the purpose of doing business with industry, with, uh, uh, with government, and with other institutions. Uh, Ohio State has over 400 MOUs, these memorandums of understanding, uh, with institutions around the world more than any university in the country. But those are kind of like love letters. <laughs> we love you and you love us, and you'll never see us again. And uh, <laughs> we might leave a pin and, a, and, and an OH and, and an Ohio State flag. That is not what it should be about. If we're going to be truly internationally engaged, we need to be globally present. And by doing that, and, and you were with us in, in, in India, you know that we spend a lot of time really talking about how do we create relationships for our students, our faculty, and for uh, for embedded uh, folks in those countries to be able to come together through the moniker of Ohio State. And that's the only way we can do it. We have to understand, uh, we have to have a worldview, not a jingoistic American view. It's very, very important for us. Yes, sir. Pat Patrick. Hi, thank you. Patrick Tarian with the Columbus Council on World Affairs. Um, can you help comment perhaps on uh, what I see as two competing um, uh, philosophies around global engagement? One being, uh, in order to be successful, we need to be competitive. And so it's this competitive-based thinking. Uh, on the other hand, in order to succeed in saving our world and each other, we need to be collaborative. And so these competing forces tend to come into my world a lot, and I appreciate your yeah. comment on well, that. Well, uh, you know, let, let's, just look at the, let's just look at the data. 315 million American souls, 
There's 1.2 billion Indians or 1.3 billion Chinese. By the year 2050, uh, uh, India will cross the 2 billion mark. If it's just based on mass alone, we've already lost. And so, so we can't think about this as competition. We have to think about it totally as collaboration. And, and that's one of the reasons for the green card, as Jane just asked about. That's another reason that we think about these international collaborations. And it's, one, and, it's a, and, a, and it's another reason we think about partnerships, because we have so much to learn and so much to gain. But the minute that we make it Fortress America or Fortress Ohio, and the minute we say that what we're going to do is we're going to hold our uh, riches to ourselves and we're not going to share and we're not going to be uh, available internationally, we have already lost that issue. Um, and if also if we take a look at it as competition. So my view is the fact that yes, it, it, the world has gotten very small and, and if we think about it as competition, then, we, then, then what we've done is we've made it even, uh, even more rigid, not, not more fluid. And the fluidity, I think, of those relationships are what's important right now. Yes, sir. Hi, Joshua. We were at Transform Construction. Um, I'm involved in uh, several neighborhoods where we're doing, I'm just working with um, South Side, East Side, and West Side, where we're doing construction initiatives to kind of re rehabilitate the neighborhoods. One of the things I've noticed is either e both with the youth as well as the adult population, lots of these neighborhoods, whether regardless of their race, they're not going to ever go to college. Many of these youth aren't. However, there's a huge need within the trades, vocational side. But often that's seen as kind of like the lower rung on the ladder when in fact they could actually make as much money as somebody who's in more of a white collar. Is there any thought going into the university or education kind of bridging kind of the trades slash vocations with standard education to make it? I want, I want you to know I didn't plant that question. I, we, don't <laughs> even, we don't know each other. Um, I, I, I think that that's one of the burning issues of the day. Uh, obviously, as the president of a great American university, I'm very compelled to have people come and get a, get a great education. I'm compelled to have everyone have an education, period, and this is the issue. Uh, for all too long, we've thought about it. We've kind of truncated these conversations. It's, it's K through 12, and then it's uh, undergraduate and graduate education, or else you go off into, uh, into the hinterland in some way or other. We really do need to think about education as a continuum. It's K through life. And what some of our most valiant partners, for example, have to be the community colleges and, and, the, uh, and the technical institutes. Uh, the days of the arrogant university are over. Unless we partner with the great uh, community colleges, with the technical school schools, and that we understand that we all benefit by in, and engage the uh, creative and, and well-educated citizenry, then we have lost that. So, our, our, our intent, for example, is, uh, is to work very closely with our community college colleagues. Uh, the governor asked us to, uh, to come together as a higher education community to think about we, how we fund higher education and how we fund such activities as, you, as we've just talked about. We finally got together, so it was no longer a competition, but collaboration, um, and I do think that we're making real progress on that. I, I actually think that Ohio leads the way in that regard, so I feel very encouraged that it is no longer about you and me or them and us. It has to be all about us. It's, it, it's very important. One, you're, you're still in charge. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Next great. question. My name is Edwin England. I'm from the Educational Service Center of Central Ohio. Mm -hmm. And first, a quick story. I was a first-year graduate student in the, the Department of Philosophy back in the mid-'90s uh, when a man in a suit uh, came into the graduate student uh, offices at University Hall, strode up to me, shook my hand, wished me a happy Valentine's Day, and pressed a cookie wrapped in cellophane from one of the vending machines into my hand, and then walked back out. And I turned to one of my peers and I said, who was that guy in a bow tie? And he said, oh, that's the university president. So we have met before, but oh, thank you Oh, I remember you well, here. my friend. I, I'm sure you do. Uh, I wanted to follow up a little bit on the question that was just asked. Uh, Nothing changes your perspective quite like having children. And though my wife and I are both educators and I am a passionate defender of the liberal arts and a broad education, uh, our children were wired differently than us. And they did not learn very well in a standard classroom setting. Uh, and I'm looking at personalized learning, all those sorts of things, the buzzwords these days, project-based learning, career readiness, those sorts of things that we work on in K through 12. And I'm wondering how you see technology or other changes in the future affecting university degrees well, and vocation? You, you know, a, a lot of, I, I will not say a lot. I will say a number of my colleagues at the university are very fearful of so-called MOOCs and, and, the, and the online educational experiences and so forth. I'm not. 
I think that there are a number of ways to salvation in this world. And I think that I think the new technology we either master it and, and it's our friend or it's our enemy. It is it is and it has to be our friend. And so, for example, uh, I, I recently had uh, I recently had uh, dinner with Sebastian Troon, who is the uh, who's the founder of Udacity, the Stanford uh, professor, and um, and he started talking about the fact that on uh, through his online educational program, he's able to get to people who otherwise are not able to learn in 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 uh, kind of the kind of the standard way, and also that he's able to develop ways for us to get into into high schools, into uh, into communities that, that really do have real challenges. So my view is the fact that technology is absolutely imperative. I think that uh, we're developing a hybrid model at Ohio State. If uh, I, I was just yesterday, I gave a speech in Indianapolis in which I talked about our law school. And law schools are not always the most innovative part of a university, and I don't say that negatively. I'm a law professor, and I always need to have a job there. But, uh, but uh, <laughs> saying, that, saying that, our dean, who is very creative, uh, has realized that we, don't, uh, we can't fill every gap, and we've got tremendous, uh, tremendous challenges in, in law schools right now. And so what he did is he... Um, is he uh, created, of uh, uh, course, we have the best election law program in the country. And so he is offering election law to a number of institutions, starting with the University of Iowa, and they happen to have a great professor on securities, and they're offering to us. So that notion of now sharing and collaborating is enormously important. But one of the things we have to understand is our kids are wired much differently. My, my, my two little four-month-old uh, Great, uh, not great, heck, I'm not. <laughs> Is this being recorded? I don't want to have that. Uh, that they, they, they just are going to think so differently. You, you know, I, uh, I had the first cell telephone in the state of Colorado, and, and it was as big as a, uh, uh, I'm leaning out the door, I'm listening to this kind of stuff, and now, you know what I mean, we're carrying everything around, the world has changed, and we have to change with it. And one of, the prob one of the problems with universities, one of the problems with the world, frankly, is the fact it's led by, by uh, older people. We need to get the younger people leading a lot more right now. And it was a Cheryl's cookie, by the way. Yeah. Um, <laughs> one more question. Um, so your thinking about partnerships, collaboration, engagement, sharing is tra has transformed very uh, a countless amounts of departments and agendas within the university. And I'm so grateful that last year you took on the thinking about student engagement. And you charged the community and the university to think about how do we start it on day one with an event with, and we welcome students for the first time in our whole com community's history. We actually intentionally welcome them into our city. Um, but you saw that as a, a symbolic of something bigger. And I would love to have you share that vision with this group about how you see how our community and our students can mutually benefit from them being engaged and them sharing all the assets that well, we have. Well, thank you. And by the way, I didn't find that question either. One of my favorite uh, students was the vice president of student body when I first came to the university. So saying that, saying that um, I'm going to be very, very quick because we're out of time. Uh, and, and it is this. One cannot have a great university if we're not in a great city. One cannot have a great city without a great university in its center. But yet, for so many years, we were separate apart. We didn't know how to spell each other's names, a variety of other things. One of the great blessings about, and, and we saw this in Sao Paulo, and we see it everywhere we go. One of the great blessings about Ohio State uh, as an institution is the fact that it is in this m vibrant, multicultural, dimensional city. And now we have to have our students understand that. We have to have them come here. We have to have them engage in the city, engage in the work that is going on, engage in the life of the city. They'll improve it. The quality of life will be better, and their life will be better. And by the way, they'll, they'll stay here and make this a great city. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Gordon. Uh, he's truly a fine example of uh, Cap cap and gown coming downtown. And we, we, he's done it several times for us, and we, he's invited back any time. It's always uh, enjoyable uh, and certainly educational. Uh,